This is Matthew Cratter from Trader University. And today I want to answer the question, what is DeFi? What is decentralized finance? If you're interested in learning how to make money in both bull and bear markets, or you just want to see what I'm trading or investing in, be sure to hit that subscribe button. So I've been getting a lot of questions about DeFi and uh, I'm finding it to be a very, very interesting space. So I wanted to just share with you sort of the basics about it. And then if you guys are interested, we can delve a little bit deeper. So DeFi stands for decentralized finance. You may hear other terms floating around open finance because it's open to everyone, permissionless finance. That's probably my favorite term for it, permissionless finance. Uh, you don't need permission to participate. And what DeFi is trying to do is it's trying to cre recreate or create a completely new sort of parallel financial system. Now, what, what happens in the current financial system? Well, we have all these uh, activities like saving, lending, borrowing, trading, trading stocks, trading cryptos, trading futures, insurance. These are all parts of the financial system. Now, DeFi is sort of the great grandchild of Bitcoin, which was really the first big successful decentralized money protocol. As it turns out, most DeFi applications or protocols, this is all software we're talking about, are built on Ethereum, which is known as programmable money. The name of the network is the Ethereum network. The, the money that actually exists on it is called Ether. E-T-H is the, uh, the abbreviation that you may see. Now, a lot of people have called me a Bitcoin maximalist because I've criticized currencies, cryptos like XRP and Cardano. And so I would say that I still, uh, my biggest uh, cryptocurrency, the one that I'm most interested in and have the most money invested in is Bitcoin. I like the security of proof of work. I like the simplicity. And I think Bitcoin is going to win the store of value contest. It's going to be the, uh, the new version of gold. It's going to be digital gold. That being said, the more I look into DeFi, it looks like a very, very fascinating experiment to me. The jury's still out but it does make me more bullish on Ethereum and on Ether. So let's, to, to understand decentralized finance, I think the best way is to compare it to uh, centralized finance. In other words, traditional finance, the existing system. This is, and I'm based in the US, so this is sort of my, you can know where my perspective is, but centralized finance, traditional finance, it's all permissioned to open up a brokerage account, you need to sign up, you need to give them your name, you need to give them a lot of personal information. And banks, brokerages in the US are required to comply with anti-money anti laundering rules. You'll sometimes hear the abbreviation AML, as well as KYC, which just stands for know your customer. They're supposed to get to know you, to find out and make sure that you're a legitimate individual that you don't have some shady fast, that you, some shady past, that you're not laundering money, and you're not um, uh, that you're somehow registered in the system. You have to give them your social security number so you can pay taxes, etc. So this is traditional finance. Traditional finance is closed source. You can't really go inside your Robinhood account or your Schwab account or your Wells Fargo account and see all the details, all the details. These are sort of black boxes and you just have to sort of rely on them. Now, the, system, the current system works decently, uh, but as you, if you've been watching my videos, you know how critical I've been of the US banks and the central bank, etc. One big problem with traditional finance or centralized finance is that it can be censored. If PayPal doesn't like you, they can freeze your funds, they can kick you off. If they don't like something you've said, maybe you've, something, you've said something bad on Twitter, uh, or on YouTube that goes against the thought police, they can freeze your funds. The US government can obviously freeze your bank account uh, at any time. So that's one problem with centralized traditional finances. It can be censored. It's also expensive. The current financial system is controlled by a cartel. You can think of them as being like drug dealers. That's how I think of them, where they control the space and they don't want any new. They control this street corner. They control this city. They don't want to let any new entrance. And this this cartel has really wormed its way into the financial system as well. They have very good lobbyists, uh, the banks, the regulated exchanges, the uh, stock exchanges, the futures exchanges. And what they are is basically rent seekers, which means 
they're sort of parasites who live off the existing system. They, they try to craft the regulations in such a way that it keeps new entrants out. And of course, the central bank, the U.S. central bank, the Federal Reserve, has this huge uh, monopoly on printing money. And the U.S. dollar is currently is, is beginning to look more and more like monopoly money, no pun intended. But this is one problem with the current system. It's, it's highly controlled. It's highly corrupt. It is the essence of the fiat currency system and crony capitalism. So traditional finance is expensive. Another example of it being expensive is if you've ever bought a house, you know all the silly fees that are associated with it. So many years ago, I bought a house that was on top of a hill. It wasn't near any bodies of water, but the bank, I got a mortgage for that house, the bank needed a flood report. And they charged me $100 for a flood report, even though you could just look on Google and see that it was, it was literally on top of a, of a hill. It could have gotten struck by lightning, but it was never going to be, um, it was never going to be flooded unless we had a, a, a recreation of, of the Noah's, Noah's Ark flood. Uh, but basically, this was whoever provided that flood report had a very good business because they get, whenever there was a house sold in the Bay Area or in that particular area, they got a cut. They got $100 for just going into, into their database. So this is there's a lot of very silly stuff in the legacy financial system, which we call centralized finance. It's built using leg legacy systems as well. This is why the Wells Fargo website looks so terrible, why Schwab's website looks so terrible. Robinhood is a bit of an improvement, but it's just it's appalling how slowly things change in finance in America. And it's because you have these these institutions that have an iron grip on it, and they don't need to change. Uh, Wells Fargo, their website is is extremely primitive, uh, even after even after 20 years, and but they don't have to change because they are one of the big banks, and they are uh, they service the Federal Reserve. Now these legacy systems are very slow, as we said, they can be censored. You can have your money seized by the U.S. government. Uh, but they're also very slow. If you want to send money, it's ridiculous now. Uh, finally, it seems like some of these banks are allowing you to send wires online. But until fairly recently, you had to actually go into a branch, fill out all this paperwork on a piece of paper, and then they would transfer the paper into the computer. And then if you were after two o'clock, you couldn't, the wire wouldn't go through, all these ridiculous things. And if you've ever tried to send an international wire, it can take days or even a week or more. So these legacy systems are very bad. And the reason they're very bad is that there's no competition. Everything is centralized. Everything is regulated. Everything is controlled. And so this is something that does appeal to me about DeFi. I've been called a Bitcoin maximalist. Uh, and I would say I am a maximalist when it comes to Bitcoin as a store of value. But I like the idea of more decentralized systems. And the more I look into DeFi and Ethereum, the more interested I get. So we just talked about centralized finance, traditional legacy finance. What is DeFi? Well, DeFi is the exact opposite. It's decentralized. Anyone can sign up. Uh, it's permissionless. There's no uh, KYC, no AML. It's all open source. For most of these protocols, software protocols, which I'll be showing you, you can go in there and you can see exactly what's happening. It's not a black box like your Schwab brokerage account or your Wells Fargo account. It's completely censorship resistant as well. No one can see your, seize your assets in many cases. For the most part, they don't even know who you are. And it's much less expensive as well. So for all these reasons, and because of my sort of libertarian bent, I'm not a true libertarian, but I am sympathetic to some libertarian principles, DeFi really appeals to me. So let's see, if we were recreating the... U.S. financial system, what would we need? Well, we'd first need a form of money. And when it comes to money as a store of value, I still only like only like Bitcoin. Um, but let's say we want to recreate the financial system. So we need a stable currency and the U.S. dollar, even though it loses value over, over long periods of time and there's a lot of money printing going on, it's fairly stable, especially compared to emerging market currencies. It's a fairly stable currency, so you need a stable currency. You need checking and savings accounts. Savings account is where you put your money and you earn interest income, or at least you used to, until the central bank uh, penalized everyone by lowering interest rates basically to zero. 
And then you have various exchanges. You have stock exchanges like the NYSE, the New York Stock Exchange, the NASDAQ. You have options exchanges, you have futures exchanges, etc. So these are the three main things that I'm going to be talking about in this video. And there are obviously more than this. Now, each of these has been replaced or can be replaced in this decentralized finance ecosystem, in this DeFi ecosystem, by three different protocols. Now, Bitcoin is a protocol, Ethereum is a protocol, and these are what are called DeFi protocols. When you hear protocols, you should just think of a software program or code that runs. These are fairly decentralized protocols as well. And uh, things, something like Uniswap, for example, is, is almost completely I would say it's completely decentralized. But let's let's just go through these three major protocols. MakerDAO is a protocol that allows you to create a stable coin that's called a DAI, D-A-I. And one, D, one DAI is it's basically pegged to the US dollar. It can fluctuate a penny or so away or maybe a couple pennies away. But it's basically a stable coin that's created when someone deposits usually Ethereum, Ether, deposits Ether into the MakerDAO protocol, and it spits out a DAI, which is equal to one US dollar. You need something like this simply because Ethereum and Bitcoin are fairly volatile at this point. In fact, they're extremely volatile, and this is a, a very safe way of making a stable coin. So this would correspond, MakerDAO, which is the name of the company, would correspond to the US dollar. You have this, this stable coin called a die and here's the here's the maker dow website now what would correspond to a savings account the savings account would be compound finance or compound this is an interest rate protocol that lets you borrow money but it also lets you earn interest just like a traditional savings account and there are various ways in in future videos if you guys are interested i can go to some of these protocols um, so compound would be the equivalent of a savings account in DeFi. And finally, what did we have? We had uh, the stock exchange, a NASDAQ stock exchange. The equivalent of this, even though it doesn't trade stocks, I don't think at this point, would be a protocol called Uniswap. Uniswap is, rather than being a centralized exchange like the NASDAQ, it's a decentralized exchange, a DEX. And right now, I believe you can only trade ERC-20 tokens, which is a money standard that's based on Ethereum. Most tokens are ERC-20. And this is one thing that gets me very interested in this as well. You have standardization, and it looks like it looks like uh, Ethereum is winning this race. Bitcoin is not programmable in the same way as Ethereum. And so what, that's why I've begun to think that there may be space for both Bitcoin and Ethereum. So we have uh, MakerDAO to produce stable coins, equivalent of the US dollar. We have Compound, which can give you, uh, enable you to earn interest account, interest income. And you can see that various, they have different protocols for different cryptos for WBTC and ZRX. You can see the different interest rates on here, which I'll link to. Uniswap, they call it an automated liquidity protocol. I like to think of it as an exchange where you can trade all these different pairs, all these different tokens. Now, one, another way of thinking about these DeFi protocols that I see all over Twitter, and I think it's a useful metaphor, is money Legos. These are different Legos. Maker, Maker DAO is a, is a Lego, Compound is a Lego, and Uniswap is a Lego. They're sort of forms of infrastructure or software infrastructure, and you can combine these different money Legos to build your own creation. And as soon as I understand it a little bit better, I hope to make a video on this. It's very cool. You can you can you can put these together. So you can take a stable coin. You can add a, an interest rate to it. You can add interest income to it. You can insure it, and you can you can combine these different protocols to create your own money Lego creation. I want to finish with a term that you've probably been hearing a lot and wondering what it means, and that is the amount of ETH, the amount of uh, ether or ETH locked up in DeFi. If you go to DeFi Pulse, which seems to be the main website for this, you'll see that there's currently a total value of about 8 billion locked up. And it's locked up across these various protocols. We can see Aave right now has the, uh, the most locked up, Maker as in MakerDAO, uh, Compound is down here as well. Compound has 627 million 
US dollars worth of ether locked up. And the way this works, for example, when you hear that term locked up, if I'm gonna make some DAI, so I, I'm able to make DAI, which is a stable coin that maintains its value. I can make it by taking some ether, some ETH, depositing it, depositing it as collateral within MakerDAO, and then printing or minting some DAI that I can use. And so when I do this, I lock up ETH inside of MakerDAO and it becomes, it becomes counted down here as part of the amount of ETH that's locked up in MakerDAO. Now what's really interesting is that you can see that this is really the, the amount of value that's been locked into DeFi has really exploded this year from around a billion now up to seven or eight billion. The current market cap of Ethereum, and one reason I take uh, Ether and Ethereum so seriously is a proxy for success of a money is how big its market cap is. Bitcoin is obviously still the big, um, the big daddy in this space, has a market cap of almost $200 billion. Then you have uh, Ether, Ethereum, Tether is another, another stable coin, and then XRP, which is junk. Um, I've already made a bunch of videos about that. But basically, I think simply because Ethereum has such a large market cap, it's one reason that I've been trying to give it the benefit of the doubt and digging into DeFi particularly. So if we do just a rough back of the envelope calculation and we say that $8 billion, uh, $8 billion worth of Ether is locked up in DeFi, the market cap of Ethereum or Ether is roughly 40 billion. That tells you that about 20% of Ethereum, the 20% of the Ether that's out there is currently locked up in DeFi. And so this is, DeFi is a space that's swallowing and swallowing more and more Ether. And I think that this whole idea, I like this whole idea, as I said, of decentralized finance. And if this is going to be sort of the monster that eats ether and locks it up, I think it's very bullish for ether. We can talk a little bit more in a later video about the money supply of ether and how it's created and how it's burned, etc. how it may be burned. Um, that's more for another video. But I think that this is a good introduction just to DeFi. And when you hear how much money is locked up or how much ether is locked up in DeFi, it can give you a proxy for how quickly the space is growing. If you go to this website, you can see the different protocols here. You can see the name, Aave, Maker. We talked about Compound. We talked about Uniswap. You can see the amount of Ether as measured in US dollars that's locked up. And you can also see kind of the category of the protocol. So Maker, uh, Aave is a lending protocol. Maker, I guess it's a lending protocol as well. Uh, Compound certainly is. We talked about how you can use that to make your own savings account. Uh, synthetics is like a derivatives exchange and um, or, or a way of creating derivatives which derive their function, derive their value from another security. And then Uniswap, when you see DEXs here, that just means decentralized exchanges. So you can think of a decentralized version of the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ. If you found this video helpful, be sure to hit that subscribe and like button, hit the notification bell, and let me know in the questions and comments whether this is something that interests you. I'm, I'm personally becoming very interested in it. Uh, I just want to get a gauge of how many of my listeners and subscribers are interested in it as well. I think this is a very fascinating space and that we're very early to it and that there's a huge amount of potential here. And so that's one reason I've been doing a lot of deep dives into DeFi. And so I hope you found this video helpful as well. Thanks a lot for listening and I'll see you in the next video.